I'm a physician who ran for office and, and is still engaged in the political arena. And a lot of folks ask, you know, how does that uh, work? You know, as a doctor, why did you find your way into politics? And, um, and you know, Rudolf Virchow was sort of one of those, uh, you know, for the folks who, who, who start in medicine and end up in politics, uh, he is sort of a historical figure, um, a historical role model, uh, because he began his uh, career as a doctor. He's actually a, a pretty famous pathologist. He actually invented uh, the science of pathology and then, um, and then realized that exactly like his quote said, so much of the work of medicine is about healing people, but that uh, politics is about doing that on a, on a system-wide scale. It's medicine on a systems-wide scale. Uh, in a lot of ways, that's the way I, I ran my campaign, and that those that's the the, the policy framework that I used. And so, um, so those two were were really guiding um, uh, guiding principles for me um, that that sort of explain what's coming in the book. You know what I liked about your angle in the book is that you acknowledge that you and like many of us uh, in in the immigrant Muslim community in particular live a privileged life, um, and uh, we have to. Um, work towards helping the underprivileged and talk about the social injustice. But sometimes I see that people are try to be more Catholic than the Pope uh, in trying to uh, uh, work on social justice. And it just comes off as just not very authentic. But I thought your angle in acknowledging our privilege and then working uh, for the underprivileged came as, as very real and, 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 and a, an effective narrative as well. I think um, it's important to be really nuanced about privilege. I actually have a whole chapter in the book called Privilege. And, um, and the reason why is because privilege comes in, in, in a number of different forms. And sometimes I think we're really obtuse about how we think about it. You're either privileged or you're not. And the, the point that I, I think I was trying to make in the book is that there are a lot of points of deep privilege that I have. I'm you know, an ex extremely educated person. Um, I uh, was raised in an upper middle class home. Uh, and I got to go to great schools, and I never really, when I was a child, never really wanted uh, for anything material. And at the same time, um, you know, I, I ran for office as a guy named uh, Abdurrahman Hamid Sayyid. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, people without my educational background or socioeconomic background would potentially have an easier time of it than I did, um, simply because of what my name is and the color of my skin and how I pray. And so I think it's important for us to like have an honest assessment of the ways in which we are both privileged and the ways in which we are not privileged and what that teaches us about both our responsibility in the world and also um, also the opportunities that we have to do real work. Uh, and so I get frustrated sometimes when folks in our community say, well, I'm, I'm somebody who's, you know, lacks privilege because of my name and faith. And I, I think, yes, you lack certain privileges because of your name and faith. And at the same time, there are many, many other privileges that so many other people uh, in our society just don't have. Um, as a function of their backgrounds. And so I just think we need to be nuanced about how we talk about this. Yeah, it applies not just to those around us in our neighborhoods, but also to our own families. And I think you point the same thing is when you look to your cousins and your aunts and uncles in Egypt, and when I do the same for my family in Iraq who uh, have suffered for so long, yet we have the opportunity here. And it was that opportunity that has given us the, the chance uh, to make a difference, to make an impact. And I think we're always we should always remember those people who have been left without opportunity. That's absolutely right. And, um, and so much of, I think, what we owe in this moment is the recognition that we both understand what that looks like not to have it, the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to have it, um, and the responsibility that we have to it to make sure that more people have that kind of privilege. I think in the end, you know, work is of two types. You either are increasing privilege for people who have it, or you're increasing privilege for people who don't. Um, because privilege begets privilege. And the question is, what are you doing it for? Tell us about that moment that President Bill Clinton tapped you on the shoulder after your commencement speech before 60,000 students at the University of Michigan uh, as, the, uh, as the speaker. Yeah. Um, you know, I was... Uh, I was a pretty good student in college, and I got the opportunity uh, as the, the valedictorian of my um, class at the, the University of Michigan to give the student commencement speech. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I'd, I'd never spoken in front of an audience like that before. Most of my speaking had come giving uh, khutbah on Fridays uh, at the campus Jum'ah. Um, 
So it ended up being about 60,000 people. And um, I had worked really hard on my speech knowing that, you know, President Clinton is a pretty legendary order. Uh, and so I didn't want to get, you know, I, I knew I was going to get shown up, but not, not, not as badly as, as I could have been. So um, worked really hard on my speech. And, <clears throat> and actually the moment before I was supposed to give it, I just pushed my notes aside. And I was like, you know, I, I always give the speech better when I just do it from my, my mind. Uh, and so I did. Um, and, you know, in the middle of his speech, he actually uh, mentioned me in his speech, which was a really nice thing for him to do. And then afterwards, I was, uh, I was um, waiting in line to talk to him. And there was a, you can imagine a pretty long line of people who wanted to talk to him. So I, I decided that I was going to go and meet my, you know, my wife and, and my family and, and, and let him have his time and space. And, uh, and he ended up coming to me and, and tapping me on the shoulder. And, um, you know, if you've never met Bill Clinton, he has this rare ability to remember people and also to just look into you. And so that's what he did. Um, and the first question he asked is, why are you going to medical school? Uh, which, you know, at that point, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, you know, I'm, I'm brown and Muslim. It's just what we do. Um, but I caught myself before I said, and I told him, you know, I love people and I love science, which is the truth. I'm, I'm probably the only uh, Egyptian American doctor whose parents didn't really push him to be a doctor. Um, but, uh, but, um, but I told him, you know, I, I love people. I love science. It's, it's how I want to serve. And he said, you know, you have a rare gift for speaking. Uh, maybe, maybe someday you'll run for office, which was a great compliment coming from somebody who's as uh, incredible a speaker as he is. And I laughed. Um, but I couldn't help it, but I was, you know, I, I don't know if you saw my first name, uh, Mr. President, but, um, there are 11 letters in my first name. And, uh, <laughs> he looked at me for a second and he kind of laughed with me. Um, but, uh, you know, it was the first time anybody ever told me I should run for office. And um, I didn't really think about doing it until, you know, more than, uh, more than, more than 10 years later. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for, for his advice and also you know, grateful because the year later, I got to watch Barack Hussein Obama run for president and win. Um, and it was the first time I ever saw myself in politics at all represented. Tell us about Martha, um, the story you tell yeah. about uh, this person that helped you understand what empathy means and how it's important to have empathy in resolving our uh, epidemic of insecurity. Yeah, um, so Martha is a, is a woman I got the opportunity to take care of uh, when I was in medical school and I was in my fourth year uh, in what's called a sub internship in a small hospital. And so the doctor that I was working with was, he gave me a lot of room to, to, you know, to in effect be a, a, the, the, the patient's doctor. Um, when she had fallen and hit her head, found herself in the emergency room and um, you know she had been drunk in the morning uh, and she was clearly homeless and so the doctors didn't do a full uh, workup on her they didn't give her a CT which is you know baseline what you do for someone when they hit their head and when I uh, came down I asked you know what did the CT show they said well we didn't do one and their argument was that she would be a quote-unquote social admit uh, which means that she was poor and destitute and they didn't want to admit her um, I ended up pushing my attending to admit her, and we did. Took care of her for two weeks, uh, diagnosed her with full-blown AIDS, um, uh, an actively bleeding pelvic mass, um, paradoxical hypotension. So one of the things that HIV can do is um, infest in the adrenal glands, which control your uh, blood pressure. And, um, and so she had a low blood pressure, despite the fact that her whole life she'd had a high blood pressure because the HIV had destroyed her glands that control blood pressure. Um, and so ended up working uh, with her for two weeks, found the only rehab facility that takes HIV positive patients in New York, got her a two week stay there, and then uh, secured her housing afterwards because of her HIV status. Um, and in the day of discharge, she decided that she uh, didn't want to go to that discharge that I had worked really hard to get. Instead, she said, you know, I'm going to go home with my mom, with my daughter. And I said, you know, you, you never told me I had a daughter. She said, I know, but, uh, but I, I, you know, I patched things up with her. And then I said, you know, you really ought to go this to this rehab and then you know get your housing set up and, and maybe then after that um you know patch things up with your daughter and she said you're not better than me you don't know you don't know uh, my life don't tell me what to do i said you know you're right um and so she went home uh with her daughter who made her wait for three hours before she picked her up and uh two weeks later i was just I'd, i just finished my residency applications um and i was getting on the subway to go and have dinner it was a turkish restaurant i was going to and I walk on the subway and uh, I see a woman laid out there on the subway stairs and uh, it's my patient. And, um, and at that point I went home and I pulled my residency application. Uh, it was just, uh, it was surreal. But it forced me to ask a lot of questions about both what I could do as a physician and then also um, what the 
what the responsibilities were to being able to build out a society that was just that much more just and equitable. And, um, and I think, I, I think, I think for me, it was, it was, it was an important framing moment uh, where um, I realized that we needed a lot more as a society than, uh, than, than just, just another doctor. And so I, I decided not to do my residency. I pulled my application um, and decided instead to, to go into public health. We're talking to Dr. Abdurrahman as Sayed, uh, author of Healing Politics, uh, public health official, Rhodes Scholar. Um, we can go on and on uh, about your accomplishments, but I hope everybody gets your book, Healing Politics. It's a really, really important read uh, for all of us who are concerned about uh, the inequities of our society and public health and the overall health of our democracy. Uh, Dr. Sayed, how does the current state of the pandemic reflect the overall epidemic of insecurity? Um, you know, to be honest, uh, I always call it the epidemic underneath the pandemic. And, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves right now a couple of questions. Number one, uh, why did we fail to prevent this? You know, a lot of people think that a pandemic is just like any other act of God, that it just happens and you can't do anything about it. Uh, epidemics are like fires. They start small. And if you don't prevent them, they get big. Um, and so now we're in this position where we're fighting an inferno. So the first question is, why didn't we prevent this? Number two, um, we're not flattening the curve the way that other societies have managed to. The question we have to ask is why not? Uh, the third question is, um, you know, how do we save livelihoods and why are so many livelihoods at risk? And then the fourth question is, um, uh, uh, why, um, why are we so ill-prepared as a healthcare system? And I think the answer to all of these questions is the epidemic of insecurities. Let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, Right now, people are affected by uh, a series of interlocking systems, all of which have been uh, uh, taken over by um, folks who are interested in leveraging them for profit um, rather than providing for public goods. Um, whether that is the healthcare system where 10% of Americans don't have healthcare, um, an additional 60% have their healthcare behind a paywall for half the year because of a deductible. Uh, a housing system that is uh, that provides more subsidies for folks buying homes uh, who earn more than six figures than um, than for folks who are uh, living uh, paycheck to paycheck and have to rent uh, an infrastructure system that's fundamentally failing this country uh, a system of, um, uh, of, of of corporate financialization that has uh, left our economy creating more gigs than real jobs uh, failing to provide basic benefits and in a political system that has been uh, doctored by the breaking of a firewall uh, between our corporations and our economic system and our political system. All of these things, uh, every single one, um, goes back to this uh, space where people feel that the means of a dignified life are just out of reach, which leaves us feeling fundamentally insecure, anxious about ourselves and our future. Um, and that anxiety itself leaves us more interested in preventing bad things from continuing to happen than in coming together and solving the systems and building the systems. So we're in a position of fear rather than a position of hope. Um, and so, you know, this, this epidemic is something that, um, that laid the groundwork uh, for this moment of vulnerability. It, um, it uh, created a space where rather than investing in public health, we, uh, we dis, uh, dis, dismantled it, um, disinvested in, you know, the CDC on the one hand and the federal side, and then uh, a 45% drop in funding for state and local health departments over the past 15 years. Uh, and um, it's left people deeply vulnerable. So even when we talk about um, our responsibility to flatten the curve and to socially distance, you've got low-income people who work gigs or are working you know, uh, uh, hourly wage jobs who are making decisions between, uh, do I stay home and, and keep my family safe or do I go out and earn uh, the, 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 the livelihood that I need to be able to put a meal on the table for my family. All of these things coming um, against each other because we have failed to create a system where people are uh, secure in the first place. And so we've got a real responsibility uh, to stand up and address that. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties, but we did hear you. Uh, um, I, I wanted to say a little bit about the American Medical Association. You don't look too fondly upon that uh, august body, why not? No, um, you know the term socialized medicine. It was uh, it was created 
by the AMA to oppose uh, Truman's proposal for a national health insurance program. They've been on the wrong side of every health reform there has been largely uh, because they fear what it would do to their profits. Um, and they've led themselves into a system now where doctors are fundamentally disempowered in the healthcare system from, to begin with. Um, and that's because we've seen a rise in major insurance corporations and, um, uh, and, uh, and major hospital systems that, you know, frankly, have just marginalized doctors out of the conversation. And so, you know, the, the AMA has a real, um, uh, a real responsibility in the fact that we as a country don't have what every other high income country in the world does, which is a functioning national health insurance program uh, that would guarantee everybody health care, address the systematic disincentives in our system, uh, and address the fact that we pay more for less when it comes to health care than any other uh, country in the world. What is uh, epidemiolog uh, epidemiolog uh, let me try to pronounce this, uh, epidemiologic transitions? Yeah, the epidemiologic transition. Epidemiologic um, transition, so, yes. So, you know, I, it, it's, it's weird to say now, but um, in the middle of, a, of an infectious disease pandemic. Uh, but when you look at, at how people die now, um, even, even through this pandemic, most Americans, when they die, will die of chronic diseases, uh, heart disease, cancer, stroke. These are not the same diseases that, uh, that for most of human history took lives. For most of human history, um, the, the vast majority of deaths were to infectious diseases. Uh, you would be lucky if you lived long enough to die of a chronic disease. Um, and those infectious diseases disproportionately kill uh, infants and children. And so what tends to happen over uh, the course of, of quote unquote development in a society um, is with the capacity to invest in basic sanitation uh, and infrastructure, you see a deep decline in, um, in, the, uh, in the burden of infectious diseases um, and a deep increase, a steep increase in life expectancy uh, as our ability to prevent uh, infectious diseases, which disproportionately kill babies and children, uh, increases and uh, people live long past their childhood. So, you know, traditionally infant mortality was extremely high. Um, you know, one in three babies would die. And then of them who survived, one in three would die before their first birthday. That was most of, most, most of, of, of the human existence, right? That was the condition. Uh, and so if you can imagine, right, the average life expectancy in society where babies and children are dying um, at, you know, one in three levels, you're talking about very, very low life expectancy. Um, and, you know, one just nugget here that I want people to understand is, you know, when you talk about um, places with low life expectancy, so for example, Sierra Leone's life expectancy is 52. Um, it doesn't mean that people get to 52 and then die. Um, what it means is that so many babies die that when you average uh, the average age of death, it looks extremely low because babies are dying. If you make it past that age, you're going to live into your 60s, maybe even 70s. Uh, whereas, you know, the longest lived society, Japan, has an extremely low infant mortality, extremely low child mortality. And, uh, their life expectancy is um, about 85. Uh, and so, you know, our life expectancy is 76, um, excuse me, 79, because we still have an astoundingly high infant mortality, and it's not evenly distributed. Most of our infant mortality is in uh, low-income communities, disproportionately Black and, um, and people of color. And so uh, their high infant mortality, very similar uh, to middle and, and even some low-income countries, um, is what brings down our infant mortality rate, uh, which, which is what brings down our life expectancy. And that's not because uh, of, of anything to do with biology. That's everything to do with socioeconomic position, access to resources, uh, structural racism, and poverty. You mentioned in your book also 13 remedies and ideas to heal our uh, epidemic of insecurity. Uh, some of them are very interesting. We won't have time to go over all of them. Of course, this is your book. Uh, Healing Politics by Dr. Abdurrahman uh, Sayed, uh, that's out now for everybody to purchase. Uh, but you talk about federal elections oversight, you talk about uh, public banking, social media reform, food reform. Can you comment uh, on, on those four ideas of yours? Yeah, so um, uh, the, the first one was uh, federal, federal election oversight. Federal election so reform, yeah. Right now, um, 
yeah, we, we, we leave it to um, the states to decide how we apportion congressional seats, which leads to a tremendous amount of gerrymandering. I, I think, you know, there is an opportunity for us to have a, for, like the, the FEC could expand uh, to include a board that apportions uh, uh, congressional seats uh, in a way where uh, appointments are made on a longer term basis. So there's not the same uh, politicking that exists when you leave it to a state house and a governor. Uh, to make a decision about how you draw the lines. Um, and just for folks who don't understand what gerrymandering is, it's a way to apportion, um, apportion uh, seats by voters, um, or excuse me, rather voters by seats rather than uh, seats by voters. And the idea here is that, you know, if you can, what they call pack and crack, right? Pack all certain kinds of people together and then right. crack different communities to get from, from each other. Or what you, you can do is split them seats. In yeah, you can split them in half, a whole ethnic community, so they don't make any impact in the elections for that district. Exactly. It's, right. it's really about reducing power. And so, right. um, and so if you had a federal uh, oversight board that apportioned this across the country, it might be done a lot more fairly um, than what we have right now. And then the second one you talked about was food reform. Um, uh, in uh, our country right now, uh, we've seen a quadrupling of obesity rates since the 1970s. And a lot of people think, well, that's because people don't exercise and people eat too much. Um, those things are true, but then the question becomes why? Well, uh, we've created a whole system by which access to unhealthy foods uh, is so much more prevalent. Um, and part of that starts with the way we subsidize corn. Um, and so, you know, the way we've uh, artificially increased the amount of this extremely caloric substance uh, on the market means that it's going to be turned into all kinds of other things like sugar. Uh, like gas for our cars, um, like, uh, you know, uh, feed for cows. Um, and, and, and that's not even a natural feed, right? Cows eat grass, they don't eat corn, but we feed them corn because it's cheap. Um, and it's cheap because we subsidize it. And so uh, we've got to rethink how we're subsidizing foods. So rather than subsidizing corn, which we know is deeply unhealthy, we should be subsidizing fruits and vegetables because that's what we tell people uh, should be 50% of their diet. And so um, if we're serious about, uh, about the way we think about um, health, then it's really critical that we pattern that across our society. Um, and rather than allow these continual agricultural subsidies for things like corn and soybeans, which are less healthy, we should be subsidizing what is more healthy. Um, third example, point that you made was uh, public banking. Public banking. So um, a lot of folks in our society are what we call un or underbanked. They just don't have banking resources simply because they can't maintain uh, the level of cash inside an account uh, that allows a bank to, to to give them banking access. So I actually think we should have a public bank, right? Very similar to have, we have a public postal service, there should be a public bank. But banking also does something far bigger than just make sure you have a bank, right? Um, that, you know, saves you money on having to cash your check and they take 6% off the top. Um, it's also a way to facilitate the construction of infrastructure. And right now, our infrastructure is um, breaking. And a lot of local and state communities can't um, amass the capital for a major project because they have to maintain uh, even uh, budgets every single year. And so, you know, allowing them to get a real loan uh, matters a lot if you want to invest in an infrastructure project. And so this public bank could also provide that service um, for folks. And, you know, you could pull that you could do this out of the Federal Reserve. Uh, you could do it out of, you know, its own you know, public infrastructure bank. But it's an idea I ran on when uh, I ran for governor for the state of Michigan, but really would be even more powerful federally because you now have municipalities and states, in effect, borrowing and, and, and le lending to each other. Social media reform. Yes. Um, you know, is, is, we all know the role that um, Russian social media played uh, in our um, in our elections in 2016, so much of the way that we think about uh, the, 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 the world is driven by, um, you know, these algorithms that drive us things that we already agree with on our social media. Um, and it can be gamed, just like we're seeing. Um, and so I do think we need to regulate social media companies. We regulate all kinds of other media, right? That's what the FCC does, the Federal Communications Commission. Um, so there's no reason to think that you couldn't have regulation of social media one easy way to do it, right? Because here's the challenge, right? If you regulate social media, then at some point you run up against challenges with um, freedom of speech. But if you just basically forced social media companies to uh, call all their bots 
so that there weren't bots on every social media channel. It would fundamentally change the way that uh, information reverberates around um, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. Um, and so just forcing them, you know, basically just saying, look, we're going to fine you for bots um, would change the, 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 the way that they operate. Um, and also breaking them up, right? So, you know, if you think about the major social media right now, um, Facebook owns uh, obviously itself and then it owns Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, and that's a problem, that's a monopoly. Uh, and so you, you've got to think about applying the same kind of antitrust uh, approach to, uh, to taking on social media. Why should people care about the cholera epidemic in Yemen? Because people die. Um, you know, at some point there is this uh, implicit narcissism that we think that we or the people closest to us matter more than other people. And just because people are poor or, uh, or underserved or that you don't see them doesn't mean that their lives don't have meaning and, and require support. And so, you know, you've got this cholera epidemic that's raging in Yemen. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm really afraid of what happens if and when uh, coronavirus hits Yemen. Um, but it's a place where, you know, infrastructure has been devastated because uh, of a Saudi-led war. Um, and uh, all of that is about proxy battles with Iran. Like this is um, people dying unnecessarily, not even just from war, but because of the, the, the long-term devastation of war. Um, and we should care about it because we're human. We should also care about it because there are sisters and brothers in Islam. We should also care about it because uh, we have a responsibility to stand up to tyrants who make war unnecessarily in, in the form of people like MBS in Saudi Arabia. Um, and so I think there's a real responsibility for us to, um, to stand up to them and, uh, and say enough is enough. Um, you know, I'm really frustrated uh, often by our, our uh, federal foreign policy, as I'm sure so yep. many people on here are, but, um, but we have this, uh, this, this, this failure to apply just very simple principles. And to me, um, we should not be in the business of subsidizing any, any other country's foreign military. That's just it. Like, right. I'm not interested that my taxpayer dollars go to pay for anybody's military, whether that be Egypt's military, where there's an active military dictatorship, uh, which is the country of my parents' birth, or it's Saudi Arabia, um, or it's Israel. And I think there's just a responsibility to be upfront about that principle and apply it evenly. Um, Senator Sanders uh, released his coronavirus package recently. Can you elaborate a bit on what that includes? Yeah. Um, I think what he realizes is that uh, this is this is showing the showing the fundamental fault lines in our society um, and recognizing that we don't just have to respond, but we have to rebuild. Uh, and the response would mean that it would uh, limit the the costs that people have to pay in a moment where uh, they're finding it difficult to just make uh, make a buck um, in terms of putting a moratorium on things like uh, on, on things like rent and, and utilities. Um, it would put a lot more money in people's pockets so they were able to, uh, to provide their families um, uh, the, the means that they need. It would uh, not um, bail out corporations, which is what, what a quarter of uh, the $2.2 trillion CARES package did, um, uh, opting instead to put money in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bank accounts of real people and small businesses. Um, and it would recognize that, uh, that these social investments are actually also a public health investment. The, we talked about, you know, why is it that social distancing has been so hard? It's because people have to choose between a life and a livelihood. Um, by allowing them to, to have security in their livelihoods, they can focus on saving lives. And um, that's what we need right now. You know, I, I, I think what you're doing is, is shifting our paradigm from national security as the only uh, and core issue for U.S. policy and, and shifting it towards human security the security of the masses, the security of the people, the security of individuals and creating infrastructure for them as opposed to just selling arms and going into wars and losing a million people and calling that collateral damage, but then saying, well, this is, a, this is about national security and then we just, we just move on. So I, I, I applaud you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. Shift you know, so I'm, thinking. You're right, right? But you know, and the, and the, the key thing we have to remember here is that the reason it's so easy for folks to get away with those uh, trillion dollar expenditures um, to fight wars is because there's somebody who makes a lot of money on the back end of it. And, uh, and it's hard when you're talking about fighting for people's human security because there's a lot less money to be made. Right. And I think that's the, that's the biggest shift is that how do we move from a paradigm that tells us that somebody has to make money off the back end of something for it to be meaningful 
to one that says that actually human well-being and welfare ought to be the way we frame everything we do in society. A uh, question from Aram Khan. We have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left with you because I know you got to hop on to another interview in a few minutes. Um, from Aram Khan uh, asks, um, I saw this tweet that you shared about the disproportional COVID-19 burden on black Michiganders. Could you explain how we can use this time in history to help advocate for vulnerable people, even if we may not have the personal knowledge to do so? I'm pursuing a degree in data science and want to know what I can do in my future career to combine, combine my two com passions to help others. Yeah, um, I mean, I think t telling, the, telling the, the story that the data show um, is really, really critical. And, uh, and making the argument that when people are, are vulnerable, are left vulnerable and insecure, the consequences of these mass disasters that happen in society, which by the way, will continue to happen. It's not like we're out of the woods because you know coronavirus happened. The, the idea that we're not gonna have multiple hurricanes or fires uh, coming on the back end of this is you know, just unfounded in the data. And so I think it's, it's about being able to continue to make that argument to, to move the culture so that A, we have the empathy and the compassion for folks and B, that we um, can make an argument around what smart, thoughtful public policy looks like. Um, and data is gonna be critical for that. So, um, but just never forget the people behind the data. That's the key thing. Um, finally, um, what, what's, what's our health grade as a democracy? It's an interesting question. I, 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 I would say that um, our democracy is struggling. I'd probably give us a D plus, C minus. Um, and the reason why is just because uh, we've seen so many attacks on our democracy. And it's not just Donald Trump. It's easy to just point to Donald Trump and be like, well, he's the reason why. And when he's, he, he leaves office because we will elect somebody different in the fall, then everything's going to go back to normal. I'm just going to say normal wasn't that great. Normal is still where corporations uh, have the rights of people, uh, are able to dump billions of dollars into our politics to influence our viewpoints. Uh, where people have their votes suppressed, where people don't have access uh, to basic means because they have a job that pays a fair wage, where 10% of our population can't get health care at all, and another 50% uh, have their health care behind a paywall. Like, that's normal for a lot of people. And just because it wasn't, you know, the mass tragedy of either Donald Trump or this pandemic uh, doesn't mean that it wasn't a, a whole suite of individual tragedies happening all the time without us paying attention. Um, and so, you know, our, our democracy is struggling right now. And I think we all have a responsibility to it. And I'll say this, like, I, I know what it's like to, to be in a society that doesn't have it. Um, I know why my dad came here. And, you know, the, the fact that I could even think about running for office is a function of having a democratic society. If I grew up in the society in which my parents were born, I would never have been able to run for office because nobody can run for office because there's not democracy. Um, and so, you know, I, have, I, I hear a lot of pessimism sometimes in our community that it's all rigged anyway. It's not. Um, we have to make a choice to unrig it because there are people who want to rig it. Um, and that's the nature of power. So, uh, you know, there, there is a, a cost to standing up to power. Um, but in the end, you know, the responsibility of building a society where everybody has justice, that, that's what this place was founded for. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Abdurrahman Sayed. Uh, his new book, Healing Politics, uh, has just come out. I hope you all purchase it. Tell us, why did you uh, choose that title? What led you to that title? A um, couple of reasons. Uh, I had a hard time, you know, uh, nailing the title down. There was the, the first iteration of the book was called Moral Medicine. Um, and people thought it was like actually about medicine. And I was like, no, 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 it's not about medicine. Um, so I knew that it had to, I had to put politics somewhere in the title. But I also love the fact that healing politics means two things. It means healing politics, uh, as in the verb form of healing. And then it's the adjective form of healing, which is a healing politics. And um, and I'm hoping that I can speak to both, that there is an active responsibility we have to heal our politics um, through a, a, a focus on empathy, and then that um, the kind of politics that can heal us uh, is, uh, is one that focuses us on the disease that we're all suffering right now, our insecurity. Well, I'm sure many, many young Muslims are looking up to you, just like uh, you looked up to uh, President Clinton and President Obama. Uh, and that motivated you to join public uh, service. And I hope young, young Muslims are doing the same right now as they're watching you and um, watching you with uh, admiration 
um, and, and uh, a lot of pride. So thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman al Sayed, for joining us again. Well, we, um, you know, and you know this well, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There are incredible people like you who've been doing a lot of work to lay the groundwork. So I deeply appreciate that. And um, I hope that uh, folks aspire to be, you know, a lot better. Um, there's, there's a lot more uh, work to be done. So grateful for you and, 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 and your time uh, and MPAC's time in hosting this. I hope that uh, folks will check out the book. You go to healingpoliticsbook.com um, and, uh, and check it out. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman Sayed. And again, go to that uh, website to get that book uh, for healing politics. Uh, buy a handful and, and give it to your friends and family. It's really an important read, not just for our community, but for the whole country. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have Sarah uh, uh, Abdel Hamid, who will be talking about domestic violence in this time, very important topic. And uh, go to all our webinars at mpac.org forward slash webinars. And we appreciate all your support. Uh, for this kind of work and, and other work we're doing in terms of policy and media. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.